Good afternoon, good evening, everybody. My name is uh, Alejandro Falcón. I'm a CIPSE UAE Social Secretary and Events Organizer. And I welcome you today to our CIPSE UAE webinar, Evolution of Control Valve Solutions. For those who are not familiar, uh, CIPSE UAE responsibility in the region is to promote the intellectual welfare of its members and improve the understanding of building services engineering within our society by organizing events and other activities related to the built environment. Today's agenda is a speaker introduction, a speaker agenda, session notes, a speaker presentation, Q&A session, brief upcoming six event and close out. Our speaker of the day is Colin Bridges. He's a regional business development director of Belimo Automation in the Middle East, a leading manufacturer of HVAC and life safety products. Colin has worked in the HVAC industry for over 40 years. Originally from UK, Colin has worked on some of the most prestigious projects in the Middle East, including the Burj Khalifa and Burj Al Arab. Residing in UAE, uh, Qatar and now back in Dubai, Colin specializes in advising both consultants, clients, and MVP contractors on sizing, sele selection, and cost-effective use of uh, the wide range of system solutions that Belimo offers throughout the region and globally. Belimo is a global market leader in the development and manufacturing of uh, electric actuators, control valves, and sensor solutions. Since inception in 1975, major development in uh, HVAC actuator technology comes from Belimo. Tamper actuators for building and ventilation, fire and smoke safety, VAV system, and control valves, such as the PIQCV uh, or Belimo Energy valves, give total transparency, cut energy consumption and operating costs, ensuring maximum efficiency and fulfilling highest comfort requirements. Belimo Automation FZE is the Middle East Regional Headquarter, located in the Dubai Airport Free Zone. Today, Colin will walk us through the following topics the different type of control valves available in the market, importance of control authority, evolution of control valve types, mechanical electronic type of PI control, valve twin characteristics and their application, smart valve technology, what can we expect in the future? Uh, uh, if, you need, if you have questions, uh, please write, the, write them down in the Q&A panel and they will be answered by the speaker during the Q&A session. For those who sign in uh, anonymously, uh, please kindly write your name and surname in the Q&A panel as well, so that uh, we can uh, issue to you your CPD certificate for this session. Your camera will be off and your mic will be mute. Without further delay, I give way to our uh, presenter of the day, Colin Bridges. Thank you, Alejandro, and good evening, everybody. Um, today, uh, I'm going to talk about the evolution of control valve solutions and uh, why? Because uh, companies like my own uh, and others are investing heavily in new technology. And it's a good opportunity uh, to consider uh, the technology uh, that we have today and the technology which is coming in the future. So we'll be talking about the different types of control, valve authority, uh, control characteristics, that's the trim of the control valves, pressure dependent control valves, they are still used, pressure independent mechanical type of control valves, pressure independent electronic type of control valves. These are more recent uh, uh, developments. And then moving finally to smart control valves. These are uh, the emerging technologies being developed today and some of which are available now. Uh, and it's a, an effort really uh, to let you know what we've been spending our R&D budget on and why we've been doing it, because um, one of the key reasons, of, of course, is, uh, is combating um, inefficiencies in systems. And one of those, quite notably, is uh, low delta T. So without further ado, I'll, um, I'll crack on. Um, before we talk about the different types of control valves, we should always think about uh, what the client wants, what his requirements are. And clearly, we've got to think about the comfort cooling uh, in this region and controllability within the cooling system. And that's obviously going to depend upon the type of system we're installing, whether it's variable primary, constant primary, variable secondary, etc. So, and is the uh, control solution going to be efficient? Is it going to make good use of the energy, or is it going to be a little bit wasteful uh, to achieve the comfort cooling we, we require? And the cost is always a factor for the client. So, uh, how expensive is that solution, and uh, does it make sense to employ it? 
And then finally, the cost of installing and commissioning. Is that a simple task or is it complex? Does it require a high level of skill or can it be simplified? But in short, whatever of those numbers it is, or whatever combination of those numbers it is, in short, we do want the most comfort at the least cost. So we should look at the, the main types of control that are utilized in this region. And I'll just run through these, if I may. Uh, the first is on off control. Uh, we still see it in some of the older buildings and uh, sadly in some of the new ones too. Uh, this is um, a very simple uh, form of control. It's low cost. It's not terribly energy efficient, but the control valve assumes one of only two positions. Fully open when demand is required, when cooling is required, the valve goes to the fully open position and gives everything that is available. And then when the uh, cooling condition is satisfied, the thermostat is tripped, uh, we now start to close the valve. So we're giving all or we're giving nothing. And what that tends to lead to is oscillation. Uh, so when we're, when we're fully open, we have to trip that thermostat by saturating the coil and overcooling the room. That's a little bit wasteful. And then, of course, when the valve closes, uh, it's going to take time to close. So that waste continues until it's closed. The building then rewarms itself up. And then, of course, we start the cycle again. So not terribly energy efficient, quite low cost uh, and not really suitable uh, for, um, for occupied buildings where comfort is required. And then we look at three point control, which is a sort of a compromise between modulation and on off control. And here, and I call this poor man's modulating control, we're sort of doing something in between modulating and on off. We're moving between open and closed and, and to an intermediate position. So we're, we're, we're open or we're closed or we're moving at somewhere in between. And this is often referred to as floating control. So the actuator floats between fully open and fully closed. And uh, it's, um, it's not as efficient as modulating control. It is better than on off control, but it is a halfway house. And if we want really uh, um, good uh, control and good comfort conditions, then we should elect to have modulating control. And this is where close comfort is required, commonly uh, arrived at through a 0 to 10 volt demand signal. Uh, via a DDC controller to an actuator, which is asking the valve to take a position where it can meet the uh, demand of the uh, of the space with cooling. And these valves operate within a range of positions according to the demand signal. So we've got very basic on off, not very efficient. We've got three point control, a little bit better than on off, but not as good as fully modulating and then fully modulating. And so um, we should look at the systems uh, we're employing. Uh, when I was younger, uh, uh, quite a bit younger, I must say, uh, constant flow systems were the norm because uh, variable speed technology was expensive and constant speed pumps were employed. And that, that led to constant volume systems where any energy not required at the coil is simply bypassed by a three port a three port control valve. Now, of course, that needs to be balanced. So we'll need some manual balancing valves in each of the circuits. And we maybe need a manual balancing valve in the bypass, which is going to replicate the pressure drop of the coil when we do bypass in order to maintain the balance. That's all technology. It's very energy wasteful because we're producing chilled water. We're circulating chilled water through the pumps and we're not utilizing all that chilled water because anything not wanted is simply bypassed and returns to the production unit or the heat exchanger. And if it's a production unit, it will undermine the delta of the chiller and the chiller won't be so efficient and will become more expensive. It also increases the runtime of the chiller and the runtime of the pumps. And they're two major uh, uh, consumers of electrical energy. So not terribly uh, good for the climate or for cost. And so we move now to current technology, which is, uh, is signified by variable flow systems where variable frequency drives integrated into pumps is now uh, quite common. We probably see this in 90 to 95 percent of uh, systems, thankfully. Uh, and that's a, a really good thing because we can better match supply with demand. Uh, and, but the, the issue really for the control elements is that we can't have our bypass because we rely on the rising pressures caused by closing valves 
to signal the pump to slow down to match the new normal, which is a reduced demand. And the reduced demand is signified by an increase in pressure. And we won't have that increase in pressure if we have a bypass. So we don't have now three-way valves, we employ two-way valves. And but those valves now have a much more difficult job. And if I put manual balancing valves here, they'll work quite well in design condition, but they'll only work in design condition because the pressure drops across the control valves will change as the flow rates change. And another feature of variable flow systems with this type of control solution is, of course, we might suffer interactivity between the circuits. As some circuits close, the flow will take the line of least resistance and it will start to overflow the remaining open circuits. So this interactivity will impact on the overall controllability of the system. And if we aren't able to control very well, then we can see um, uh, underflows in some circuits, certainly overflows in others, and perhaps uh, uh, leading to uh, low delta T syndrome. So manual balancing valves not really effective in this type of system where there is no other form of differential pressure control. So if we're relying on a pressure dependent a control valve and a manual balancing valve in a variable flow system, it's not ideal. It's uh, old technology applied to new systems and it doesn't work very well. And we see that today in buildings where it's installed. We see prevalence of low delta T, high energy bills, inability to meet the comfort cooling uh, requirements of the building. So the control valves need to have some authority in order to be able to control. So in this slide, I've just sort of, you probably know very well, but valve authority is uh, calculated by taking the pressure drop of the control valve fully open at design flow and dividing that figure by the available pressure, which in a well-balanced system is the total pressure drop of the circuit, including the control valve that's in the circuit. But first, I need to know the pressure drop of the control valve. So this useful chart here will help because if I know any two of these component parts, I can find the third. And uh, the, this chart shows different uh, types of uh, units. This is millimetre water gauge. This is KPA and litres an hour. This one is KPA and litres a second. This is where I am comfortable. And if I need to know the pressure drop of the control valve, then I need to know the design flow and the KV of the valve I'm going to select. And I can get that from the manufacturer. He'll tell me the uh, KV of the valve the uh, design flow rate will be calculated according to the heat loss, uh, the heat load, sorry, and we'll understand the delta P. So very useful chart. Uh, we use it a lot. Uh, we always like to understand uh, the authority of any control valves that we're going to supply. And it's important that we look for a good or at least reasonable control valve authority. And so when we take a closer look at valve authority, we can see I've split it into three uh, possibilities, 0 to 0 0.25, 0 0.25 to 0 0.5, and then 0 0.5 and upwards maybe to one. So if we look first at a poorly selected control valve with little pressure drop across it in relation to the circuit, we're going to have to settle for unstable control. Uh, anything below 0.25 generally is acting in on off. So it's no longer modulating. So we should not have wasted our money uh, buying a modulating actuator and a modulating valve if it's going to behave in this way. And that really is regarded as a poor solution. A better one would be between 0.25 and 0.5. This would be a reasonably a good selection, certainly acceptable. And a really excellent solution would be to try to select a control valve authority uh, upwards of 0.5. This would give us really good control. Uh, I'll explain why in a moment. Uh, it's a good outcome uh, and an ideal solution. And here I've said that as a rule of thumb, uh, when I'm sizing control valves, I should try to match uh, as closely as possible the pressure drop of the coil. Now, in reality, I should calculate the full resistance of the entire circuit, but uh, that's quite a task because I need the linear pressure drops of the pipe, the strainer, the balancing valve, the coil and the control valve in order to do this calculation uh, that we looked at earlier correctly. Uh, so what I've done is um, I've made a rule of thumb and said, look, if you if you size according to the coil, you're not going to do a bad job. And the reason there's a little asterisk here on the one is because that is applicable theoretically to PI control valves. 
and this is a rule according to all control valves. Uh, but uh, when we talk in terms of anything above 0.5, uh, around 1, then we really are talking about pressure independent control valves. And we'll talk about that in a little So first off, we look at valve authority and we say, let's look at an example. We've got a very simple uh, circuit here uh, with a 20 kPa uh, cooling coil. We've selected a 20 kPa control valve. We see a balancing valve, which is giving us three kPa. I'm not showing the pressure drop of the strainer or the pipe because it's, um, I want to simplify this as much as possible. I'm, I'm going to choose an EQM valve because it has to have, uh, for modulating control, this characteristic here. And uh, I'm going to do my calculation. So I've got 20 kPa across my control valve. I've got 20 kPa, 40 kPa, 43 kPa in my circuit. So that's the available pressure drop in a balanced circuit. And so 43 into 20 is going to give me 0.465. But that is only in design condition at the, on the day of commissioning or when all the valves are fully open and uh, full, uh, full demand, uh, essentially. And uh, if we change the flow rates, of course, all those pressure drops and those calculations will need to change. So it's very important to understand that where I'm using conventional control valves in a variable flow system, even if I'm using manual balancing valves, the valve authority is going to vary. It's going to vary because I'm in a dynamic system. And so the valve is going to have to respond when the balancing valve is not able to. So it will be a challenge uh, for the balancing valve uh, uh, to uh, absorb uh, pressures uh, below design flow because the pressure drops uh, enormously quickly uh, as the flow reduces. And so uh, the pressure is then left to be controlled by the control valve. So let's look now at um, the uh, three main types of uh, control. The first is number one, which is an equal percentage control valve. Equal percentage because uh, we, we want a, a need a nice slow opening valve which is accelerating as it goes to the fully open position uh, and that's required uh, for cooling uh, controlling a cooling coil. Uh, if I choose a linear characteristic valve I'll get this proportionality between the opening of the valve and the flow through the valve itself so that might be applicable for say a heat exchanger and then I have a quick opening valve in number three, and I would use this kind of valve. This might be a regular ball valve. I would use this kind of valve uh, for um, on-off applications. So it wouldn't be suitable for modulating, and nor would a linear valve if I'm modulating a fan coil or an air handling unit. And essentially, that's what we're talking about today. If I wanted, I could think about using a ball valve to control. They are increasingly being used for control, but um, they're not entirely suitable if they're not characterized. If I used a regular ball valve, you can see as I open the valve, it's quite slow, but then it quickly accelerates. And I've got a, a complete flood of flow here with a tiny movement on this axis. I get a huge increase in flow and then it softens off at the top there. So not really going to give me a nice modulating effect that I need. But if I were able to characterize the control valve, if I'm able to limit the flow in the opening position here, slow it down and then graduate the flow so it rises on this axis and my cooling coil, which is shaped like this, is the mirror opposite, then I will get uh, equal percentage because what I will get is a proportionality between the movement of the valve and the power from the coil from the heat exchanger. Uh, it's, we've called it a heat exchanger. It's actually a cooling coil, which is a type of heat exchanger. Could be a fan coil, might be an air handling unit. So the reason that I need the EQM characteristic is clear. I've got a cooling coil characteristic, which is broadly uh, this shape and the actual true shape is dependent on the delta. And then the valve should uh, do its best to mirror that uh, image so that when the two are together in the circuit, I've got proportionality uh, in the relationship between the position of the valve, the opening and closing of the valve, and the power output from the cooling coil. So that is where I need my proportionality. That's good quality modulating control. 
and it's only achieved when I choose a valve which has an EQM characteristic. So very important if I'm modulating that I choose an EQM characteristic valve. And here's a little illustration of that. Here we've utilized a ball valve, which has now been characterized. There's a disc in there, which is affecting the flow pack such that the opening of the valve is nice and gradual, as you can see. And as the flow increases to fully open, we follow this nice EQM characteristic. And that's because the cooling coil has the mirror image opposite. And when we put the two together in the circuit, we want this uh, ability, this compatibility between power output and control signal should be uh, proportional. If I'm not on an EQM valve, and I'm controlling uh, without an EQM valve, and I could be uh, giving a 20% opening or a two volt signal and end up with 45% of the power, and it's not stable. And in light load, which is where most systems live, this instability, this very small movement for a very big uh, power output is not required. It, it really will uh, mean that we'll overflow and underflow circuits very easily. Valves will hunt. Um, they will overflow and saturate coils far too easily, and it's uh, it's not desirable. So I just want to touch now on the pressure dependent uh, types of trim, the type of valve that you might choose. Commonly in our market, there are uh, probably two or three types. The globe valve is the most common simply because it inherently has an EQM characteristic. It's got a class four shut off. I'll go back to that in a second, but it does give us that proportionality that we're looking for. And it's actuated by a push-pull actuator, pushing against the pump and pulling uh, the valve open and closed. Then on some PI valves, we see plug, plug control. These tend to have a linear characteristic. They're still pressure independent, but they're linear and they're usually a little bit short stroke. And they too are class four shut off and they are not proportional. So they won't give us the proportionality that we need from EQM, but we still see them in the market. And this is why we're stressing the point about choosing EQM valves. And they too are linear actuated push-pull uh, on an electromechanical actuator. Then we look at a ball valve. A regular ball valve is quasi-EQM. We saw it earlier. Not really suitable for proportional control because it's not stable. It has got class A shut off, but it's a rotary action. And so there's some benefits with rotary action. We're not pushing against the pump, we're rotating against the uh, resistance of the seals holding the valve in place. And of course, rotary valves tend to, if you're a ball rotary valve, they tend to be less uh, uh, troublesome in dirty water because they wipe themselves clean as they rotate. Now, if we use a characterized ball valve, the one that we looked at earlier, we can have an EQM characteristic uh, and we can also have class A shut off. Uh, and of course, because it's characterized, we get our proportionality, which is very important for modulating control. And we get the benefit of a rotary action, which is through 90 degrees and uh, not fighting the pump, but merely rotating. Uh, so we get quite a high shut off value because of that. And then we move to butterfly valves, another rotary valve. Again, quasi EQM in its natural state, Class A shut off for sure, which is good, uh, but quasi proportional. Now, because it's quasi proportional, if we decide to limit the opening of the valve to around 54 degrees, we get an almost EQM characteristic. So we can almost get proportionality and we are getting a rotary action. Just for your reference, class A shut off designates a valve which shuts off at 100%. There is no leakage. Uh, a class four or sometimes they're seen as class five valves, they have an allowable leakage rate, which um, is, is related to the size and the flow capacity of the valve. And they uh, are allowed to leak a little bit of water uh, in the closed position, which might not seem a lot, but they're also leaking something very important as well. They're leaking pressure and we're looking for rises in pressure as the uh, valves close to tell the uh, DP center to signal the pump that uh, the demand is reducing, we need to control the pump nicely. So um, having an allowable leakage rate might not look very harmful, but it can actually affect the control of the system. And certainly we don't want to waste energy if we don't have to. So now I want to talk a little bit about pressure independent control valves. So we have this little um, animation. Uh, P1 is the entrance to the valve. 
we see the flow coming onto the circuit, leaving the circuit, whether if it's in the return, and it's pushing down on a spring and a diaphragm. And the spring and the diaphragm is resisted by the spring pushing upwards and along with the combined pressure of P3, which is the exiting pressure. And so there's a balance between these two, which is uh, uh, maintained constant across the seat of the valve between P2 and P3, such that if I know the constant differential pressure, and we talked about KV earlier and the calculation, we can know the flow. So by maintaining a constant differential pressure at all times, varying perhaps the KV with the actuator, which, which will move the valve open and close, so the KV might change, but we do know that if we know the available pressure and we know the delta P, uh, which is a result of the KV, we will know the flow. And so it's, uh, it's understood that uh, all uh, mechanical PI valves operate in this way. This is uh, an oblique pattern. We have inline, uh, like this valve. This is an inline version of the same valve. And you can see the internal complexity. We've got a spring here, and we've got a diaphragm, we've got a seat, and we've got the control element here. So we're maintaining a constant delta P here. We've got the flow moving from right to left. And here we're maintaining a constant delta P in order that we can know exactly how much flow we're going to see to the coil. Any more pressure, any more flow, and the valve will start to close against it just to maintain constant, in this case, the 16 kPa opening pressure of the valve. That's also interesting if that valve's on the index circuit, because on the index circuit, if I'm only measuring 16 kPa, I do know I've got my flow rate through the circuit, but I'm doing it with a minimal resistance. And any resistance on the index circuit affects directly the pump selection. So having a low pressure drop at the index and knowing what that pressure drop is, is kind of useful for saving energy. So uh, very interesting for that. But you can see uh, some of the difficulty here in trying to measure the flow. We've got an awful lot of internal complexity. So measuring directly the flow on this kind of valve, probably not possible, uh, certainly not in my experience. Just moving now to the uh, calculation on valve authority, but with pressure independent control valves in mind, let's redo uh, the calculation. We said earlier that valve authority is the pressure drop fully open at design divided by uh, the available pressure or the pressure when the valve closes. So let's look at a PI example. The pressure drop we saw earlier was being maintained constant across the valve seat at 16 kPa. So we can consider that as the pressure drop of the control valve fully open. And then because it's maintaining only 16 kPa to the circuit and the KV changes, then we can say that the available pressure is 16 kPa. So 16 through our control valve divided by 16 kPa available gives us our theoretic uh, value of one. The reason that I say theoretic is that if it was one, it would be perfect and few things in life are. So we have some small manufacturing tolerances. Uh, the spring, the commercial spring in the valve controlling the diaphragm has a P-band, which depending on how it's being compressed, will have a plus minus, and that can be uh, that can vary according to spring manufacturers. And the diaphragm is a soft EPDM device, which again will, will float a little bit as it reassumes its new position if there's a change in pressure. So we can say one in theory, but in, in reality, it's close to one. It's certainly better than 0.5. It's certainly better because it's dynamic, uh, and it's certainly a lot uh, less likely to be eroded because the spring and the diaphragm are maintaining constant the available pressure, even though we're in a variable flow, variable pressure system on the circuit that's being controlled, we're maintaining a constant pressure. So in that sense, uh, we have a valve authority very, very close to one. So for pressure independent control valves, I don't think it's sufficient to say I'm going to specify a pressure independent control valve or my troubles will be over. I think uh, there are many, many manufacturers out there, some good, some not as good as others uh, and different styles, different types, different uh, uh, materials. But these are some questions that I thought are interesting to consider when you're selecting PI valves. The first and foremost is, because I'm modulating with PI valves, 
is I need to have an EQM characteristic. This is an absolute must. I should not have linear if I expect to modulate. I should ensure that the control range of the valve is sufficient for the system pump head. Earlier, we saw a valve at between 16 and 600 kPa. So if I've got a five bar pump, no problem. If I've got a seven bar pump, I might have to think again. Ensuring that the modulating actuator can actually close against the available pump head is important because although we're maintaining a relatively low delta P while the valve is open, the minute the valve closes, it does see the available pressure. The maximum available pressure could be quite high, so we should consider an actuator able to close. We should think about maybe the class rating, the shutoff class rating. If no leakage is acceptable, we should choose class A. And if, uh, if we're happy to accept an allowable leakage rate, then we can accept class four or even class five. It is not usually recommended, and I certainly wouldn't recommend, the use of a thermoelectric actuator because they have very, very slow reaction times and usually a very short stroke. And here, this is a kind of valve where there's a wax element encased above the actuator and it is heated and it, it expands and that provides the movement of the valve. And that process can take upwards of six minutes, maybe a bit longer, and that's delay. And delay in our business is kind of a bit like waste. Because if I tell the valve to close and I have to wait six and a half minutes for it to do so, I've got six and a half minutes where I'm pushing chilled water through the circuit that isn't required. And that's waste and, uh, and not, to be, uh, not to be looked for. So check the stroke length on your control valves because some have tiny, tiny strokes. Some only uh, one and a half or two millimeters, could be less. And uh, that is not a lot of travel for the 10 volts that's going to come towards the valve uh, in the um, in the demand range. So uh, that might be a consideration for you, particularly if there's an issue about uh, aging systems where you might get the, uh, a degradation of water quality or there's potential for clogging, uh, then it might be worth considering a rotary ball valve because they are self-cleaning, uh, unlike the push-pull, and of course they will shut off at class A. Um, but if you're happy with an allowable leakage rate, by all means, go for class four. Uh, but then we're into push-pull and uh, we're not closing off 100%. So just homing in on the, uh, the points made in D, E, F and G, uh, we ran, uh, my company ran a trial. Uh, the purpose of the trial wasn't to beat up other manufacturers or to say that the limo is better than everybody else. It was to just examine the reality of using thermoelectric control valves. They're very cheap and a contractor will be very happy to use them if he thinks he can save money and um, they can purport to modulate, uh, but they do it uh, very badly because of the very, very slow reaction time. And so what we did, and I'm not going to show the video, but you'll please feel free to look it up on YouTube. The link is here. Uh, the video will show uh, a selection of thermoelectric actuators from different companies. We've not, uh, we're not naming them or shaming them, uh, and we've, we've blanked out their reference, their manufacturing reference. And it's just to show the, the intrinsic difference between a, 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 a rotary electromechanical actuator as opposed to a thermoelectric. And uh, I think you'll be surprised at some of the results from that video. But please, if you get time, have a look. Oh. When we summarize control solutions that we just looked at, we can say three things. We can say, yes, we recognize that conventional control valves have a role, but if they do, I've got to manually balance them. Uh, I've got to manually balance each of the circuits to ensure that each is getting their uh, correct flow rate, and I can only do that in design. I've got to choose a control valve with some authority, so I've got to understand the resistance of the circuit, or at least the coil, so I can try to match it with my control valve. And then the branch that these uh, valves are located in has to be balanced against the other branches. So I'll need a bigger DRV on the branch. And maybe if there are multiple risers, I'll want to balance the risers as well. So in this example, to achieve a balanced and uh, reasonable control, we're gonna need 11 valves. We're going to suffer interactivity because the control valve is the only form of dynamic control in this branch. So we know that we're going to get overflows and underflows because interactivity brings that about. 
and that's inefficient. And it's inefficient because really DRVs were developed initially for constant volume systems and now they're being applied in a variable flow system. So then what can we do about that? Well, you could, if you wished, use a conventional balancing valve uh, and uh, a control valve and then limit the pressure seen by the control valve with a differential pressure control valve. That might seem a good solution because I'm maintaining a known fixed delta P on the branch, which means I can size my control valve against it. So, but if I've got 20 kPa on each of these control valves, and uh, this circuit uh, needs, uh, um, let's say, 100 kPa to satisfy it, and the first four uh, circuits close, and this circuit remains open, I'm still maintaining 100 kPa on this circuit, so 100 kPa will be seen by this control valve here. So if I size that with 20 kPa, my valve authority is below 0.25, it'll go to 0.2. So there is a risk that um, uh, if I don't uh, uh, make very careful selections and quite high resistances actually, then I'm going to lose authority quite quickly, even though I'm controlling the pressure to each branch. And I'll need 12 valves and I'll need to balance them, and I'll need to do a fair bit of calculation. I'll need to uh, select the correct spring for the differential pressure controller, and then I've got to trust that the commissioning team know how to set this up, because there has been a tendency, I've seen it myself, where they don't really understand this, and they just do a manual balance. And that's a disaster, because this is the valve that should be doing the balancing here. It should be maintaining constant the delta P, seen by these control valves, to give them some authority. And that really explains the popularity of PI valves, because PI valves do all the differential pressure control on the circuit itself within the valve. So that's as good as it gets. Our valve authority is going to be close to one. We don't need manual balancing valves. We may elect to have a measuring device if we don't feel confident with this, uh, with this uh, arrangement, but not really being able to measure the flow too well directly. We can, by delta P calculation, determine the flow, but you can see straight away, we've simplified the installation and we only have five valves. So this is a real benefit to the installer because he has far less commissioning to do, and it could be that the supplier or the manufacturer is going to pre-configure these valves so that they arrive on site preset. And then as long as they're labeled appropriately, they can be installed and they're good to go from the off. So PI control, much simpler, much easier to understand and uh, simplifies the installation and reduces the cost. So now I want to talk a little about, having talked about mechanical valves, just to touch on electronic. Electronic don't use a spring and a diaphragm. We've replaced the spring and the diaphragm by a flow meter. The ultrasonic flow meter here is measuring the flow and telling the actuator what the real measured flow is. And the actuator is programmed with the design value. There's an algorithm in here which determines, uh, am I above the design flow? If I am, automatically I'm going to limit the flow so I don't saturate this coil. And um, if I'm below the design and I've got 10 volts, I'm going to open up because uh, the whole purpose of this valve is to maintain a, a balance and be able to control. And the, the reason that we have a spring and a diaphragm in the mechanical type is that we calculate, uh, and we saw the calculation, we calculate the differential pressure using the KV value, um, mechanically trying to maintain a constant delta P in order to uh, calculate the flow. And if we want to know the flow, but uh, my company is taking the view, well, well just measure it because uh, that really is the, the best way. If you want to control something, it's best to understand it. And, it, and the, only, the best way to understand it is to measure it. So the pressure independent control valves designed to balance by preventing overflow automatically and then able to control the flow of water to the coil. The spring and the diaphragm are no longer required. That's been replaced by an actual uh, ultrasonic flow meter. These can be very accurate. Some manufacturers as good as plus minus 2%. And usually you can access that flow rate at any time uh, by directly reading the flow from the actuator using a small uh, handheld. This is a, a similar sort of device that I'm talking about where we put an RJ45 cable into an actuator and we get a direct flow reading at any time that we wish. That's simply not possible with mechanical valves 
but with electronic, uh, it, it is, and the information is uh, very, very accurate indeed. And this is a, a short animation to show you an underflow, the valve opens, and then an increase in pressure because of interactivity, the valve starts to close. And it's as fast as that. It's, it, it's catching the overflow at source. We're not waiting for a thermostat to trip. We're not saturating a coil. We're not doing anything uh, to undermine the efficiency of the system. We're acting on real measured values. When we've got those values, we can communicate them in a number of ways. Uh, most uh, electronic uh, pressure independent valves can make use of uh, one or all of these uh, protocols. Uh, and when they are used in this way, we can uh, send the uh, design flow values to the BMS. So the BMS operator can see uh, that the circuits are being satisfied or not. If there's a problem, uh, then he can start to correct it. If there's a block strainer, he'll see the valve opening, but he won't see a corresponding increase in flow. So this action of preventing coil saturation is a very good tool uh, in addressing uh, one of the leading causes of low delta T, which is coil saturation overflow. You don't see it, it's invisible. So what does one look like typically? Well, here's one uh, ultrasonic flow meter communicating constantly with the actuator to tell it the real time flow. And the benefits, of course, are in this particular model that we've characterized the control. So we've got class A shutoff. And because it's characterized, we've got an EQM characteristic, highly communicative. And this is this is the feature of electronic uh, control valve. So where might we use now a smart valve? Uh, a smart valve is uh, uh, a valve which I would consider uh, has some commonalities. I just want to talk about where we might use them and then let's think about what they should do. So where I have a requirement for a BTU meter as well as a control valve, some smart valves have integrated BTU meters because they're measuring the flow and the temperatures. So essentially they know the cooling energy. Uh, where a flow meter is required. Uh, smart valves should, if they're very good, have a flow meter. So we don't need to buy a flow meter and a control valve. It's there in a single unit. Where delta T management might be an issue, a building served by district cooling spring to mind, where maintaining the minimum delta is absolutely critical to the costs of running the building. Uh, the building owner doesn't want to face district cooling penalties because the delta is too low. So having a valve that can manage that would be helpful. Crack units in data centers, that's a growing and emerging business and cooling temperature is absolutely critical to their efficient business operation, absolutely vital. And there is a growth in this market uh, we're seeing at the moment, particularly with COVID where we're all online, there's an awful lot of data whizzing around and these data centers are being built to handle it. In buildings aiming for some level of energy accreditation, lead perhaps, uh, might be where you want accountability, where you want to, a valve which will monitor, measure and record uh, the energy and the uh, KPI uh, affecting the, the building. In buildings where a high level of quality control and transparency is required, it could be uh, that uh, cost is a big uh, factor, it could be that maintenance is an issue, or we want to connect our building to the cloud. Maybe we are connecting the security systems in the building, the car parking, the lighting, and we might want to use the HEVAC system in the same way and use the data gathered by a smart valve and put it on a cloud uh, so that the data can be accessed, monitored, analyzed and shared. And so these things are possible now. Uh, they're coming fast. There's many manufacturers currently developing these kinds of products. There's one or two, well, perhaps more than one or two coming to the market now. And as the costs in mechanical PIVs uh, reduced in the last 20 years and their adoption was driven uh, uh, by the reduction in uh, the growth of variable speed pumps. So we're seeing a big rise in data driven devices helping to operate and manage building systems efficiently. And smart control devices are becoming increasingly affordable, just as mechanical PICBs uh, were, uh, were once considered uh, too expensive, now are considered quite usual because the costs have been lowered. And we're seeing that now in smart control devices. And uh, increasingly, uh, they're being used by building owners and operators to manage systems more efficiently. 
and uh, having a cloud component or an IoT capability is one way to future-proof a building um, for further developments. Let's look at some smart control valves. There are four here, which I've just taken. Um, there are two here, which are using calculated values for their intelligence. They're using the old mechanical means to determine flow. And the two on this side of the slide are measuring. So I think a measured value is going to be hands down a calculated value every day, but these are all considered smart valves. Smart because they measure, some calculate, flow, temperature, delta, cooling energy. Uh, they're able to monitor that data and store it. And if they can timestamp it, so much the better because that can be then used for analysis and trending. And uh, if the control can be autonomous, in other words, the uh, valve can act independently of an external operator in favor of efficiency, so much the better. Because um, the building will run 24 seven perhaps, but the operators won't. And having a valve which is able to detect things going wrong and correct it is very, very valuable indeed. And then having a valve that can communicate data, whether it's stored data or directly accessed data, remotely accessed or cloud accessed data, very, very important that we're able to make good use of that data in, in a nice way. So some of the questions that perhaps now when we think about choosing a smart valve, we should consider. We considered some points about the mechanical, perhaps the uh, uh, electrical uh, smart valves we should as well. So does, let's ask, does it measure real values or just calculate them? Because that's important. So I think uh, uh, measured value, if you want to control something, measuring it's probably the best way. Uh, is my control valve IoT compatible? Because uh, I may want to connect it to other systems in the building. Does it store and timestamp the data that it draws off the system? Is it communicative on all open protocols? Because uh, some uh, smart valves may be tied to a particular controls company and you don't want necessarily to be tied. You may, but you may not. And an open protocol is going to give the building owner the freest choice of how he accesses that information. Is it able to monitor and operate autonomously? Because that's incredibly valuable for ongoing continuous commissioning and maintaining system efficiency. It's got to have an EQM characteristic. It's not really a question, it must have it. Can it operate independently? And that is, do I need a building management energy system or, or will it operate standalone? I know that some BMS systems get turned off after a while because the system encounters problems, the operators don't understand it, so they switch it off. So having a valve that might stand alone and harvest the data on board itself might be interesting. Can the settings be accessed and adjusted because these valves might be going on a very large campus where you don't necessarily want to travel around so much, so accessing them all uh, remotely might be beneficial. Will I get support from the manufacturer? And if I what's my warranty? This is very important. And is my control valve able to have the software updated? Am I future proofing my control solutions? Uh, and as uh, your phone is improved, so Apple and uh, Samsung are very kind, they send you an update. Uh, does my control valve manufacturer do that? Because there's a lot of clever tech in smart valves and it changes and it improves. So can we keep up to date with those improvements? And last but not least, what's the shutoff class? Am I happy to accept an allowable leakage rate uh, uh, or do I want 100% shutoff? It's, um, it's a question only you gentlemen can answer. So when I've got my data, what can I do with it? This is just one example of what can be done with data drawn from a smart valve. I can timestamp the data uh, on this axis. We have the time, we have the uh, harvested data range. Uh, we have all the different elements that I might want to view and I can see them graphically here. And then they're summarized in this box here. So I can see the average delta. I can know the cooling energy in the, the period of time that this data was extracted. The total flow has been measured and recorded and I can know many things. I can track the actuator position in relation to the flow to check that the, the system is operating healthily. I can check the supply temperature to make sure it's being maintained. The delta, the return temperature, all of these elements are possible to harvest them 
gather them in and date stamp them and use them to the benefit of the system. So if I use smart control valves, I need to be able to leverage uh, their uh, capabilities. And so remote cloud communication is just one way we can do that. Uh, another, of course, is uh, data capture, whether it's on board or on board and shared. Uh, it's important that I'm able to analyze what's gone on in order to improve it and continue to improve it. And uh, do, do all these things lead to a benefit to my system? Are they managing my delta? Am I reducing my cost? So I, one of the reasons that smart valves have come into the market is to solve problems. And one of the key problems in our market is low delta T. So we'll talk about that just for a few minutes. What is low delta T? What contributes to it? What's the cost when we get it? And uh, how can these smart valves help with these problems? So let's look at why we get del low delta. Coils are usually not sized properly or the valves themselves are not sized. Too much water is delivered, that's a given. Saturation is a key cause. Aging, natural or otherwise. Degradation of the water quality or the uh, lack of maintenance or the fact that the system was never really dynamically balanced in the first place. Any one or more of these can and do contribute to low delta two. The fact is I increase my flow, I reduce my delta. Here's a power curve of a typical coil with the uh, power uh, time stamped on the uh, on the curve. We see as the flow increases, the power increases too. But the delta drops as the flow increases. There's a lovely sweet spot here where the two meet, and that's wonderful. We've got about nine and a half degree delta, and we're getting about 60, uh, 60, 65, 70 kilowatts of cooling. But if I I'm not able to give the desired flow, which in this case is 10.8 cubic meters, and I slightly allow the valve to overflow to 13 cubic meters, because this curve flattens off, I don't see a commensurate increase in power. I see three kilowatts for my quite significant increase in flow, and that's because of the nature of the cooling coil. And if my coil is sized here to operate here, then I can very easily move into this saturation zone, and that's very bad. That. Let's have a, a look. Um, if we look at calculating the energy required to increase that overflow we just witnessed, then we can use the pump affinity law to calculate it. We can look at the uh, uh, flow rate that we've designed, which is 10.8, and that should give us our 95 kilowatts of cooling. But we weren't able to control that particular coil to 10.8. We let it go to 13. We didn't see it, it's invisible. And it gave us three kilowatts of cooling more. You probably wouldn't notice it in a room. But that actually is 16% more water uh, and 3% more cooling. But if we use the pump affinity law, which unfortunately for us is subject to the cube, then we see by calculation that we're going to consume 74% more electrical energy at the pump. So a very small nominal increase in cooling, barely visible, a sizable increase in flow, completely invisible, of course, and a massive hit on the pump because the pump's working far too hard and consuming far too much energy. Pump infinity law, we can't escape it. It's a fact. And these, uh, these facts occur every day in our cooling systems throughout the Middle East. So that's the coil and the pump effect. But what about the chiller? Take an example. The same rules are going to apply. And we've got here a, a, a 1800 kilowatt chiller with a delta of six, and that needs 258 liters of water to provide the cooling. Choose the delta, and I drop it to four because maybe I've saturated the coil and I'm not simply able to maintain the delta in the way that I want. I'm now going to need 387 gallons of water a minute, not 258. So I'm going to bring on another pump and I'm going to bring on another chiller. And the problem was never the flow. The problem was never the chiller. The problem was at the coil, not managing the delta. By losing delta, we have a massive impact on the pump and on the production unit. If we didn't manage the delta, uh, then the plant would certainly operate much more efficiently. And this is where smart valves can help. They should have EQM. They should have class A shutoff. Let's think about whether we want the data to be recorded and measured or do we want it calculated? We want the, the data, but do we want it stored so we can review it and analyze it? That's important. We should look for autonomy. 
because we don't want people there managing the valve. The valve should manage itself. It's a smart valve. And do we want to rely on external software or is that software on board the valve already? Is it IoT compatible? We may want to future proof our building. And can it be updated? Because it's a very clever device and uh, the companies that make them also spend a lot of money improving their devices. So perhaps uh, we should think about how uh, future proof. So to leverage the full benefit, we've got to think about these things, about measuring, about recording, and about autonomy, because without it, I think uh, there's a danger that we'll fool ourselves into thinking that mechanical devices are actually much smarter than electronic, and that we can use calculated data instead of measured data. So here I want to show, share with you, um, it's a building installed with a smart valve. Uh, one of the uh, 60 tons of air handling, uh, sorry, 60 tons of cooling. Uh, in this building and we're going to run the smart valve in three modes. We're not going to enable the flow limiter or the delta T management, we're going to just operate it in position control. So we're listening to the thermostat, uh, whether that's in the duct or in the room space. And when we do that, we call that position control. Then we use flow control, that's the next level. And then we use delta T management. And if we use these three modes, what we can see is we still need 60 tons of cooling. But in position control, we're going to need 240 gallons of water a minute. That's because of inherent waste. In flow control, because I'm limiting the saturation at the time it's happening, I'm not waiting for the thermostat, I only need 144 gallons of water. And if I then include with my flow control delta T management, and now I'm really homing in on the efficiency because I'm managing the delta as well as the flow, and that's important because it's not it's not the design condition every day. Uh, the temperatures do vary in the Middle East and we're, we're at light load for a considerable part of the year. Then I'm only going to need 96 gallons of water. So it's a considerable benefit when I'm able to measure and then start to control flow, when I can measure the delta and start to manage the delta using smart devices, then and only then, can I then start to see genuine uh, savings in my system? And those savings have become very, very visible indeed. And so really I'd like to um, uh, finish uh, my presentation um, and thank you for your attention. I'll do my best to answer questions and uh, I'll hand over uh, now back to uh, Alejandro. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh... Colin has been really an incredible and incredibly detailed A to Z explanation on the description, operation, function, pros and cons of control valves uh, and the most up to date technology around it, which is crucial really knowledge transfer for, for our, our engineering community in an industry that is uh, every time more and more demanding on, uh, you know, energy saving with responsive control uh, by using uh, intelligent and smart technology. Really, really very insightful. Thank you very much for, for your knowledge and uh, sharing that with us. Thank you. So now the panel is uh, Q&A panel is open uh, for anyone who wishes to ask any question uh, about the presentation to Colin. Uh, please feel free to do so. I will uh, leave the, the, the panel open for some uh, minutes. And uh, please feel free. Think our attendees want to start their weekend, Alejandro. Uh, my, my view is, is actually a little different. It's like uh, your presentation has been so well explained and so really uh, technical that there is no doubt people have actually uh, understood everything. Thank you so much. And really, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, this is one of uh, one of its kind. This has been a very good presentation, very, very, really useful for the mechanical and the uh, industry and the 
DC designers. And uh, it's very, very detailed. So this, is, I believe, is one of the reasons why uh, perhaps we are not getting any any question. I think people are satisfied. Thank you. So I'm not sure. I'll give some more minute. If uh, still there is no question, we can just uh, wrap up and conclude. Let's just uh, maybe give some, some more opportunity. There is a question for uh, you, uh, Colin. Uh, oh. This is for a smart valve. The power requirement for the flow meter is? Well, the, the flow meter takes its power from the valve itself, which takes the very standard and very ordinary 24 volts, which is fairly common for um, modulating control. Um, so it's a, a completely regular uh, wiring configuration. And that's one of the reasons why this valve is suitable for retrofit applications in buildings where, where there is low delta T. OK, thank you. Um, there are some other questions over here. If the delta T is fluctuated, how to control? Well, um, just, or which, just as consultants set the design flow uh, because there is a cooling load in the building that has to be satisfied. So there is some uh, coil selection and there is some delta. In order to calculate the cooling energy, we need the flow and the delta. So the delta T set points are very important parameter uh, alongside the flow in determining whether the system is going to run well or run badly. If we see a reduction in the delta, it only means one thing usually, and that is we shouldn't have sent the water to the coil because it's coming back containing the energy we sent with it. So if the water is coming back at a lower temperature than that which I require, which is my delta T set point. So if, for example, I have a nine degree delta and the water is coming back seven, uh, with a delta of seven and I've lost two uh, K on my uh, delta, then that water is going to go back to where it came from. And uh, I shouldn't have sent it in the first place. So the pump shouldn't have pumped it and the chiller doesn't want it because it's going to undermine the efficiency of the chiller and the chiller may bring on another pump and another chiller to compensate. So the, the delta is managed because we're measuring the flow and measuring the return temperature. We know what the delta T is just as we know what the flow is. And when the delta drops below the set point, the valve automatically interrupts the DDC signal, starts gently to reduce the flow because as we give the water more time in the coil to exchange its energy, that has the effect of raising up the delta back to the set point. And once the delta T is back on its set point, <coughs> the valve automatically hands back to the DDC control. That's quite smart. Thank you, uh, Colin. There is another question here, but I'm trying to ask the uh, attendee if he can rephrase the question. Let, let me try. Uh, I just came from site having a, a control valve and it is showing in manual. It takes control and give feedback from zero uh, to 10 DC. But every say I got feedback like six or five DC in fully open position. I think uh, uh, Nugget, you need to refresh your question. I don't think Colin can actually understand uh, this question. I'm not personally able to, to understand. I think what, what the feedback might be doing, it might be in the configuration of the valve, uh, but if it's feeding back less than 10, it might be feeding back its relationship with the flow, not the voltage. It might be saying, I'm giving you, if it's feeding back five, that might be saying 50% oh, well, of the flow and not um, uh, just a, a, an electrical signal. I, I'm not fully uh, understanding the question, but. Um, yeah, I think it's a difficult question. Yeah, yeah, well, uh, he's not coming back, so I think uh, thinking away for trying. And uh, if, you, if, you, if you rephrase it, I will I will ask the question again. Yeah, it, well, anyone's free to write to me if they have. Yeah, yeah, please. that's yeah, that's what I, I was actually going to say. Like, uh, uh, if there is no further question, uh, or maybe you may have a question later once you maybe you don't review the slides or study the the, the information uh, provided today by by Colin. You can you can actually 
write him his uh, his mail ID is there. You can contact him for anything, a question of this presentation or any other nature. Please feel free to contact him there. Uh, his website is also shown on the screen. Looks like we have uh, some question here, uh, Colin. Can the similar design actuator work and function in a similar way for air duct dampers, meaning provide flow rate of air? Yes, the, um, there is there is a there are smart solutions just as they are being developed for water control. There are smart IoT and FC compatible solutions now for VAV. Uh, I say that because our company is involved in that as well. Uh, and that's how I know that. So there, there are, yes. OK, uh, thank you. There are solutions out there that do yeah, a similar but... job. OK, there is another question. Um, someone is asking, does your valve control work uh, by digital voltage or analog voltage? It, uh, it can be uh, either or. Uh, we, have, um, we have a switchable option, so it's, uh, it's either or. OK, that's interesting. Anyone else have any, any question to ask Colin? Otherwise, we wrap up. No? OK, uh, I will share my screen for uh, a second. Hope you can see my screen. I just wanted before uh, finishing, since I have you all here, brief on uh, our uh, next upcoming event, which is uh, Green Wall Protection by uh, Chris Channel. He will talk about the irrigation systems application for fire protection. Tentative day will be 12th November at uh, 5.30 uh, p.m. So stay tuned. And I hope you guys all enjoy the webinar. Uh, thank you very much again, Colin, for your insightful presentation. Very technical, very detailed, uh, very instrumental. So I hope the, the, the people really enjoyed and they uh, really learned from this. We'll share the, the, the presentation. Uh, a video will also be uh, uploaded on uh, YouTube uh, SIPS uh, channel. So you can see it again if you have any doubt of the uh, technical content. Uh, and that's it. See you again on our uh, next webinar. If you need to, uh, if you want to uh, co connect with us, please follow us on LinkedIn. You, you can follow us on Twitter as well. You can see in the screen our two accounts. Visit us on sipse.org and if you have any query of any nature, you can write us at uae.sipse.org. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening. And again, thank you very much, Colin, for your time and effort in this presentation today. Thank you, Alejandro, and thank you to all the attendees.